Back in the 1980s, there was a young executive by the name of Joshua who had a great job in the business section of Chicago. He recently bought a brand new black Jaguar 12-cylinder XKE car. And on his way to the business section in downtown Chicago, he was going a little too fast, but looking to make sure none of the children darted out in the streets. And he caught something out of the corner of his eye, which was not a child, but was a brick. Whack! Hit his car. Well, he hit the brakes, rammed it in reverse. The kid wasn't going anywhere. And uh, went back there, jumped out of the car, grabbed the kid. What are you doing? Do you know how expensive that car is? What's your name? Why did you do that? And the kid was just crying and crying. Kid didn't run. And the kid said, Mr. Mr., would you help me, please? He says, what do you mean? He says, my older brother, he fell, his crutch broke, and he's in the street, and he's too heavy for me to pull him out, and no one will stop to help me. So that's why I threw a brick at your car, so someone will stop to help me get my brother out of the street. Well, the executive had a little lump in his throat, and he said, bring me to him, so they walked around the corner, and there he was, lying about five feet into the street. So he got down and picked up his brother and brought a hanky out and dusted off some of the dirt and the scrapes and that. And then he watched his little brother be a crutch to the older brother hobbling down the street. As the story goes, Joshua didn't fix the dent in his car until... He sold it. (laughs) He decided to keep it there so that he would be reminded not to go through life so fast that someone has to throw a brick to get your attention. Anyone have any bricks thrown at them this week? (laughs) Anyone have maybe a crutch that you were leaning on that snapped and broke? and put you in a vulnerable position? Sometimes these things happen. And the truth is we all have crutches. Some may be good. God knows some of them are not good at all. And he loves us to sometimes have a break in our lives. Well, today I want to talk to you about broken crutches. And we, as you know, we're reading through the Bible Ten chapters a week, and then I try to preach, you know, and I can't wait till we get into next week into Daniel. It's going to be fun. But we're going to finish up Ezekiel, and I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 29. We're going to read the first seven verses as we talk about broken crutches. Broken crutches. And we're going to see how God was upset with his people because they were leaning on something that he knew was going to snap, and it wasn't him. And so let's uh, go ahead and stand up with me. And I will read the odd verses, and that's good right there. And you can read the even verses with me out loud, amen? In the tenth year, in the tenth month, On the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. This guy kept a journal when God spoke to him, didn't he? (laughs) The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Say, speak and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you. O Pharaoh, king of Egypt, O great monster who lies in the midst of his rivers, who has said, my river is my own, I have made it for myself. But I will put hooks in your jaws, you can read it with me, and cause the fish of your rivers to stick to your scales. I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers. And all the fish in your rivers will stick to your scales. Verse 5. I will leave you in the wilderness 
you and all the fish of the rivers, and you shall fall on the open field, you shall not be picked up. Verse 6. Gathered, I have given you as food to the beasts of the field and to the birds of the heavens. Next verse. Then all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel, or a crutch. Then they took hold with his hand. You broke. You broke. You were a crutch, and you broke, and tore all their shoulders. They were leaning on you. When they leaned on you, you broke. And made all their, verse 8, or backs quiver, verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I will bring a sword upon you and cut off you from man and beast. Amen. That's good enough right there. No, don't sit yet. <laughs> Broken crutches. I want to talk to you about broken crutches. That if you lean on the wrong crutch and it breaks, it could hurt you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would help me to speak with eloquence today. Not with fancy words, but with your word so that your people can hear and understand. I pray, Lord, that what I say will generate seeds of faith in their heart. And Lord, that we will examine ourselves to make sure that we're not leaning on the wrong things in life, replacing you with those unsturdy reeds and crutches. Help us, Lord, to have an ear to hear what your Spirit is saying. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, let me give you a little background of our text today. God is really mad at Israel. He's going to judge them. They're going to get destroyed. They're going to go into captivity for rebelling against them, for not putting him first. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Well, they had different gods and different idols and all these other things. And so God sent Babylon to come and be a vessel of his judgment on his people, Israel. And instead of them repenting and getting their hearts right, they said, you know what? Let's get a hold of Egypt. Let's let Egypt be our ally, and we can lean on Egypt. They can be our crutch. And so that's what they decided to do, but... There's a truth. Let's go to number A. I want to tell you about some truth about crutches with Israel and with us, you and me. All right. Number one, the first thing you need to know about life. All right. There's nothing new under the sun. Go to number one, please. You are going to face problems that will be beyond your ability in this life. Sooner or later, you're going to do it. Whether you're a follower of Jesus Christ or not, it's going to happen. Now, if, it's, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you come to the season where the peace goes and adversity comes, God will use that and desire to use it for you to drive closer to him. That's called faith. And faith only grows with adversity. No one's faith ever grows in seasons of peace. That's why Christians don't always have seasons of peace. Because nothing grows in peace. But faith eats adversity, trials, tribulations, and we got to know when they come into our life what to lean on, where to go. Now, there are some trials in our life that we can handle and uh, we can get through them. But then there may come, number two, let's go to number two, there will come seasons in our life that if you're wise and you have a little humility in your life, you're going to be forced to ask other people for what? Yeah. 
I'm sure you've heard that saying, no man is an island to himself. And the ones that are islands to themselves are the ones that usually fall hard, really hard. That's where a lot of addictions and destructions and suicides come from. But God is warning you through this text today, these things are going to come. And the question is not, are they going to come? The question is, when they come, what will you lean on? Or who will you lean on? So let's talk about some of the dangerous crutches today in the United States of America. Now, of course, I'm just going to mention two or three. There's more than these. But uh, let's go to B. Let's go to uh, dangerous crutches. All right, letter B. And the first thing that people lean on, and it's only normal, is relationships. But how many know you never find out who your true friends are until trouble comes knocking in your door? And I don't know about you, but when trouble comes knocking, sometimes the people who you thought were faithful are faithless. And the people who you thought were just acquaintances in your life show up at the door with some hot food. (laughs) And it's like, wow. So not all relationships are bad, but most of us have friendships and relationships or boyfriends and girlfriends and this and that. They're not as sturdy as we think they are. And God out of love brings trials and tribulations into our lives so that you know what crutches are good and what crutches are bad. You see, if you went down to Egypt in the Nile, they have all these reeds that grow up. And if you looked at the reeds down in the Nile, you would think, wow, those are sturdy. But if you pulled one out and tried to lean on it, as sturdy as it looked, it was good for nothing. Just like some of our friends. Just like some of our friends. And so God in his love realizes if you keep that relationship, that's going to hurt you. You're going to fall. And you might get hurt. Go to the, um, the next scripture, please. A great proverb says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I got three older brothers. When I was young and I read that, I used to think they brought the adversity. <laughs> but when I got older, and one, one of my brothers wife came down with MS, and the other one, unfortunately, two of them went through a divorce, I began to realize what this verse really means. When people in your family go through hard times, a brother is to be there as a sturdy crutch. Be there for them, amen? So important. They need us. Reminds me of the funny story of these four guys that went to Duke. They took organic chemistry, and they were pretty, pretty smart. Straight-A students, and in their cockiness, they decided the weekend before the final exam that they would go up to UVA, University of Virginia, and go party up there. So they went up, partied at University of Virginia, and they were having a good time at that campus with their friends, and uh, they decided, oh, let's party Sunday night. It will wake up early Monday and make it back in time for the organic chemistry exam. Well, you know if you're drinking and you try to make decisions when you're drinking, that's all I need to say. <laughs> so they slept in, jumped up, got in the car, and were like a half an hour late. Immediately they all went to the professor And they came up with the concoction that their tire was flat. That's why we weren't there. Would you please have mercy on us? The professor thought, and he says, sure. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., come here. I'll put you in four separate rooms, and you can take the exams. They go, oh, this is great. So they go home, and they do their little study. The next day, they come up, 9 o'clock. Get in the rooms. They start, and they open up the first page, and it says, for five points. 
said something about free radical formation. They go, oh, I know this, free radical formation. Writing down the answer. Turn the page. For 95 points, which tire was flat? Would a real friend help you to lie? Now, I've been guilty of that when I was young. It's a broken crutch. Got to take that organic chemistry all over again. Another, let's go to number two. Another broken crutch in our nation and uh, I didn't realize how bad it was until our, our former President Trump, uh, a lot of people, a lot of African Americans and a lot of Hollywood people brought this to the light, the opioid crisis that we have in this nation. And it's just so sad. Now, I mean, there, there are different drugs, of course. You know, alcohol can be one. I'm, most of us have at least one person in our family who have a weakness with alcohol. And uh, they try to lean on alcohol because they think it will numb the pain, though it might numb the pain for a bit. How I many know it doesn't solve the pain? It doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't resolve the problem. And of course, that same numbness with alcohol kind of goes in with drugs, whether prescription, like we have with these opioids, or non-prescription. And we are in a crisis in this nation. And of course, it's really sad when you hear what's coming out of Washington where the uh, pharmaceutical companies got in bed with some of our doctors and wanted to make money, and they just started writing these prescriptions to get our kids addicted, you know, out of high school, football, basketball, hockey, soccer, lacrosse, whatever, and then college sports, and then professional sports, and then, you know, they're hooked. And I've had two cousins commit suicide in the last three years because of drugs. So... I know a little bit of what I'm talking about. And I'm sure some of you have been touched by this. It's a broken crutch. It's a broken crutch. God help us. I thank God that it was never one of my weaknesses. But it is becoming a greater and greater problem in the last days, the Bible says, there'll be an increase of sorcery, is one of the scriptures. And the Greek word for sorcery is pharmakia, where we get our English word pharmacy. Isn't that interesting? And if you understand sorcery, sometimes the way you get into witchcraft and sorcery is through drugs. It opens up the spirit realm to you. Very dangerous. And of course, there's, there's another crutch. Let's go to the third one, very popular in our world, and that's religion. I'm not talking about Christianity. Let's go to number three, ladies. I'm talking about religion. People thinking that they have a guilty conscience and they're going to try to earn their way to heaven with good works. It's a lie from the pit of hell. No one gets to heaven being good. You can get to heaven by being good, then there is no reason for Jesus to go through what he went through. All right? So we have religion in this world, and religion is Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, Shintoism, Hinduism, and there's some isms that I didn't mention. And they're basically man's way of reaching God through sincerity, good whatever it is. Christianity is God's way of reaching man. Religion is man's way of reaching God. Christianity is God's way of reaching man through his son, Jesus Christ. Where Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through me. No one. So it's totally different. And then uh, Titus 3, 5, and 6 says, It's not by your works of righteousness, which you have done, but according to his mercy we're saved. And then let's go to the other one in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You know this one, the grace. Read it with me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can't do anything to earn your salvation through Jesus Christ except believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's it. All right. Well, then why do we do works? We don't do works to earn salvation. We do works out of our gratitude. In fact, verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. But the good works don't get us saved. The good works come out of a heart of gratitude for salvation. So we have to be careful that we see people. And God is speaking to Egypt. And he says, you know what? My people were trying to lean on you. You said you'd help them. But you know what? You didn't keep your word. Now, I'm going to judge my people, but I'm going to judge you too, Egypt, because you said you would do something, you didn't do it, and that makes me mad. Even though I'm mad at my people, I'm mad at you Egyptians. So after Babylon comes down, they're going to smoke you, and then they're going to go smoke my people. Because I don't like it when people pretend to be a crutch for someone. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah sure, yeah, yeah. No, people who just talk so they can end the conversation and get, out, get away. And it really hurt them. And so God was mad. How many know sometimes God gets mad? How many know God is good? How many know a good God can get mad? <laughs> well, let's go on to see. How do we as followers of Jesus Christ become a sturdy crutch? I don't want to be a broken crutch. I don't want to be a reed down by the Nile where someone says, wow, that looks good. Let me lean on that and snap. Well, the only two ways I know that we as Christians can become a good crutch for people, and I'm talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ, our family, our true friends. Someone said, you're lucky to have a handful of good friends when you get older. Most people don't have more than five. Most people don't have more than two or three. And if you still have a good friend from high school or elementary school, that's an exception. It really is. But the friendship will be tested. It's like faith. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. So the first way that you and I can become a sturdy crutch, go to number one, please, is we have to learn to lean on God. Not lean on God. No, you've got to learn to lean on God. Because when you get saved, you don't just say, I'm leaning on God. <laughs> God allows a few storms to come into your life to say, well, let's see if you're going to lean on me. You know that scripture in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways... Acknowledge him, and he will direct the path. Or he'll make, the NIV says, he'll make your path straight. Make your path straight. I have learned to lean on God. I've learned how God speaks to me, primarily through this. But there are other ways that God speaks to me in dreams. And I was telling you, with the word of knowledge, sometimes I feel things. And I love that scripture in Mark 16, 17, it says, And these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it, by, it will by no means harm them. They will lay hands on the... And they shall... Now, when I was in seminary, and I was getting my master's, there was a professor... Uh, Dr. Stanley Horton, one of the greatest Pentecostal professors, he's gone on to get his reward, but he helped me so much. He said, in Mark 16, these signs that follow believers is not a complete list of signs. It's incomplete, which means there are a lot more signs that happen in followers' lives. So there may be signs in your life that I don't have. There may be signs in my life that you don't have. 
Not everyone heals. Not everyone casts out demons. We all have different signs. And uh, it's important to know that. It's kind of like Acts 28. If you read the book of Acts, Acts 28, the last scripture, is not a conclusion. It just like cuts. Because we're to be Acts 29. The Acts of the Holy Spirit in the Church of Evangelical Christian Church of Waterbury. We're to continue that. So I shared with you, I'm, I'm leading up to a point here, this past week I went to New York City with one of my sons. One of my sons got a recent promotion, and uh, he, he would be working in uh, Manhattan, down, uh, downtown. And so he says, Dad, I got to get an apartment. I thought, oh my gosh, my mortgage payment will be your apartment payment. So, I said, okay, let's go. And he says, got to pray. I said, oh, of course I'm going to pray. What do you think I'm going to do? You know, got to pray. And he says, now, Dad, let, let me do the talking. I got a realtor, and, you know, you just kind of come and, you know, Dad. I said, okay. What well, dad doesn't want the best for the children, right? So, so we go down there. And uh, we're walking around, and on the train, he gets a text. Realtor, first appointment canceled, 9 a.m. He said, oh, Dad, this stinks. Another hour on the train. Fourth appointment, no call back yet. Thought they'd call me back. So my son's getting mad. He says, what's wrong with these New Yorkers? So, all right, we'll pray. Let's just pray. So we get down there, and... We start walking around. By the way, I did 27,000, no, 32,000 steps that day in New York. That's the most I ever did. Most I, I did 18,000 in San Francisco. That was amazing. So we're walking around, and you know that one of the sign gifts of my life is if I'm walking and I'm praying, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit told me one time, if you're ever walking and praying, sign gift, and you see a coin, pick it up, I've answered that prayer that you're praying at the exact minute. I do not look for coins, all right? I don't walk like this, all right? It's just I'm praying, and then something shiny happens. So we're walking down uh, downtown Manhattan, and I'm walking with Jared, and uh, I see a penny. Now, for me, the sign gift is, if I bend down and pick up the penny, it's a release of faith. And I got what I have. Remember the woman with the issue of bleeding blood? And Jesus said, virtue left me. Someone tapped into me with faith. So I always do that. Now, my son doesn't know that. So he saw me reach down on a dirty, filthy New York City street and grab a penny. He goes, oh my goodness, Dad, that's disgusting. What are you doing? I said, we, we, you know, you had two of the five... Appointments canceled. You're going to get the part. That's you're embarrassing me. That go. You're going to go wash your hands right now. I, I'm calling mom. We're going to quarantine you when you get home. <laughs> Kid, not. Gosh. So I'm learning to lean on God. That's my point. That's how God speaks. So we went down. We saw the Black Cat Coffee Shop. Espresso was terrible, but it is a place to wash my hands. So. I go in there, and then, and then we go, one of his friends who went away on vacation, let him have his apartment overnight, so we, we go up there, and I come back down, and I come back down, and I see, I, I look, I see a shiny thing on the road, so he's still in the apartment, oh, I don't know, grab that, I, I know, I know, now, what you don't know is then we walk down Prince Street, Prince Pizza, fabulous pizza, I saw four more pennies on the street, 30 people behind me. But I didn't need to bend down and pick them up and embarrass my son because I already knew God had spoken to me. I was learning to lean on God. So we went to the first apartment. It was too small, you know, and, but he, I said, this is nice. It's like a five-minute walk. And then the, the first was canceled. The second we went to, the third one was canceled. Then the fourth one we went to, and the realtor didn't show up, so my son was getting mad. So, I don't know, something told me, go open the door. You know, how many know they're supposed to be locked? So I opened the door, 
it opens. So I open the next door, it opens. And so I hold the door for his realtor, who's a female, and they come in. I said, let's go upstairs. Maybe that one's open. She says, I can tell you right now it is because the person who used to own it left and didn't give the right key to the landlord, and so it's open so we can go up there. And I said, well, hallelujah, isn't this nice? So we go up there, and my son gives me the dirty eye. He falls in love with that apartment. He falls in love. And then we go to another apartment, and there's 19 people in line waiting for that apartment. And the realtor says, you know, this is amazing. We had two canceled on us. We saw two. We have to wait for 19 people. I mean, usually things don't go that smooth. And I'm just like, yeah, I know why, you know. And so my son, Jerry, says, well, I don't want to wait with 19 people. I want to take that one apartment that all those doors opened. And she says, well, this is New York. This is where people don't want to pay their rent, even if they got the money. So I need your tax statements, your bank statements, how much you got it here, what you're doing. Jerry goes, no problem. We'll get, get it to you in the next hour. Do you know he got that apartment? He got it. What am I telling you this for? You've got to learn to lean. Now, my son, Jared, he said, well, I was praying too, Dad. I said, yes, you were. Yes, you were, because we want to, we want to give our faith. To, I said, yes, you were. But it was, it was awesome. It's one of the ways God speaks with me with pennies. That's all it is. Or sometimes it's some other, you know. But how does God, how do you lean on God? How do you lean? Sometimes you got to wait. Absolutely. And he loves that. The second thing we need to have in our lives and pray about to become a sturdy crutch is not only are we to learn to lean on God, but we have to learn to bear one another's burdens. Now listen to me. This is important because many Christians open their mouths before they should. And they say something stupid like this. Well, no one ever did anything for me, so why should I do anything for them? This is what they're saying. I want to reap first what I didn't sow second. No, the Bible says you reap second what you sow first. Well, I want to reap first what I didn't sow second. It don't work that way. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. So don't say, well, no one's ever done it for me in this church. It's because you haven't done it for someone else. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What's our man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows to the flesh, selfishness. Well, I'll do it for them when someone does it for me. It doesn't work that way. Go to the next scripture in Galatians 6.2. This is in the context of a brother or sister that is fallen into sin, and they need help. They need help. They somehow had a crutch that was an illegitimate crutch, and they fell. And Paul says, you know, you who are spiritual, restore such a, a one. That's verse 1. And then in verse 2, he says, and bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love. That's it. So when you say, well, I'll do it to sister so-and-so when someone does it to me, is that love? No. No. So if we are having too many broken crutches in our life, we've got to look and see how we've been a crutch to someone else that has been sturdy, been there. And let me tell you something about being a crutch. When God asks you to do something, it's all, I don't know about you, it's always inconvenient for me. He always asks me to do something when it's inconvenient. But I kind of guess because when I need someone to do something for me, it'll probably be inconvenient for them. So if I want to reap inconvenience of someone that I need help, I got to sow. Got to sow it. It's called the law of the harvest. And we need to bear one another's burden. Jesus said in John 13, 34, 35, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you love one another. By all this, all men will know that you are my disciples if... 
you have love one for another. Yesterday we celebrated a wonderful wedding of some of the young people in this church. Wonderful. And there was a reading on love. Maria Panella did the 1 Corinthians 13, and then at the end I was admonishing it on love and, and how love is not words. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not arrogant. It is not boastful. It keeps no record of wrong. I, I said I used to struggle with that, keep record. But it rejoices in what is right, what is good. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. True love, agape love, it never fails, amen? It never does. Well, God wants you to be a good, sturdy stretch, a, a, a good, sturdy crutch for someone. And in order to do that, you need to do that first by learning to lean on God. Because when you know He is dependable and faithful, then that faithfulness can work in your life. And then it can flow as we receive His faithfulness. We can freely give it to someone else. Don't be like Egypt. Don't give promises you can't keep. It's one of my pet peeves growing up. I had a lot of people hurt me by giving promises. It just bothered me. And then I went into the ministry and I started having ministers give me promises. Oh, let's go golfing. Let's do lunch. Let's get coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Words is not my love language. <laughs> Action. Action. That's how we become sturdy crutches. No man is an island to himself. And may the Lord in his loving kindness and faithfulness to you strike down your crutches today that will hurt you tomorrow. That you would learn to lean on him and be dependable. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads, would you please? Perhaps there's someone here today that um, you have had a crutch broken in your life, and you maybe have gotten mad at God. Maybe you blame God. You're not happy at all. <laughs> And maybe this message is very timely for you, and you're like, wow. I think I'm going to call us and just a little bit down to the altar and maybe come down here and make sure our hearts are pure before God. You know, it's so human when things go wrong in life that we think everything that happens in life is God's fault. It's, just, it's human, but it's not biblical. That's why Jesus said in John 14:6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not your life. I don't want to be a part of your life. I want to be your life. It's different. So sometimes we get mad at God. I'm going to call you down in just a bit. Maybe ask God to forgive us. Maybe you had someone in your life. Maybe it's not God. Maybe it's a different crutch. Maybe it's a friend that stabbed you in the back, that did something, you just can't believe it. You, I, I've been friends for so long. I, I, I just, you know what? And God is saying, I expose that for your good. And though I understand your anger and your emotion, I did that for your good. Sometimes it's easier to recover when you're a little bit younger than when you're older from a false friend. Or maybe there's someone here that you were a broken crutch to someone and you're thinking of someone who asked you for help and you said, oh, I'll be there, and you failed. Hey, we've all been there. And maybe God's saying, you know what? You need to go fix that relationship. <laughs> you need to humble yourself and say, I was not there when you needed me, and I am sorry. You know what I'm talking about? Love. Humbling ourselves and just saying, I'm sorry. 
So I'd like you to just stand with me right now, and we're going to close in a word of prayer, and then I'm going to open the altars. I'm going to ask Joe if he's here, if he can come down. And There's not a better time than when you hear God's word preached. And whether you had a crutch broken on you, or you were the broken crutch, or maybe you're just mad at God. Just like, I got no crutches in my life. I feel like God has taken away everything. Well, God may do that for a reason. There's another great man in the Bible named Job (laughs) that felt the same way. But he didn't know God was setting him up for some blessing. And then bow your head with me, would you? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that in your mercy and faithfulness, sometimes you allow things that happen to us that may give us temporary pain, but they save us from destruction and greater pain down the road. And Father, for those that maybe have come to church, they may be a little bit upset with you because they don't understand what you're doing in their life. I pray, Lord, as we come down to the altars here, soften their hearts. Maybe for someone who just had a crutch in their life that they've known for 5, 10, 20, maybe longer, and they've just had a devastating thing happen, They've put a knife right through their heart. I pray, Lord, they would come down here and, Father, you would work forgiveness. There would be no bitterness that would get in. And they would say, Lord God, Lord, you are good and you're always faithful. You do all things well. Keep our hearts soft, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a wonderful promise of answered prayer in God's word from Jeremiah 33, 3. And it basically says, if you call unto me, God says, I'm going to answer you. God always answers prayer. Hi, my name is Paul Height. I'm the pastor of Evangelical Christian Church. And I want to invite you to look into God's word this coming Sunday and join with us at Evangelical Christian Church We're located at 1325 Watertown Ave in Waterbury, Connecticut. We love to have you this Sunday, 1030, to look at God's goodness and how he always answers our prayer. God bless you.